Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 15, though I'll read from verses 12 to 21 today. Your brothers and sisters in Christ, where did we come from and why is the world the way that it is? These are questions that we as mankind have been trying to answer for thousands of years on our own and many people want the answer to that question. But if you stop somebody and ask them in our day and age those two questions, where did we come from and why is the world the way that it is, you'd probably get an answer or something like this from many people. Why is the world the way it is? Well, pure chance. Pure chance. I mean, the universe came into being through a big bang billions of years ago, and then this earth came into being by chance a couple billion years ago, and we as a human species were just lucky to evolve from a single cell, from primordial ooze, or whatever the recent theory is, until we've gotten to where we are today. But why are we here? Well, just because of chance. There's no actual inherent rhyme or reason to the world. And even when it comes to morality, when it comes to right and wrong, that's really a matter of perspective. There isn't an absolute morality, no, even conscience, even what we consider to be right and wrong is just a construct of evolution, a construct of chance. So if you want to do that and I want to do this, who's to say any different? You know, what is the meaning of life? There really isn't one. And so if I want to do something and make myself happy, that's what gives my life meaning. That's what gives it purpose. That's what gives it value. The short life that we have causes us to have to savor and enjoy every moment because you know where we're going. We're going into the grave and then turn back into dust. Our atoms will disperse and that's that. We'll turn back into stardust and that's it. Why is the world the way that it is? There's no answer. Simply because we're here, we just accept that and live with it. Chance. Nothing could be more untrue. And nothing could be more devoid of any hope. We have the answer given to us that mankind seeks in any and every place apart from God. We have it on the pages of Scripture. And in our lesson for today, Paul takes the Roman congregation all the way back to the beginning. And he says that there was a very real ancestor of the human race named Adam. Adam wasn't some myth. He isn't some legend. Eve really existed. Adam really existed. And what we have on the pages of Scripture is history. Jesus himself even treated it as such. And if you think that it's a myth, all of Paul's argument today in this whole section falls apart. So if we want to answer, where did we come from? And why is the world the way that it is? We have to go back to the beginning. Go back there with me in your mind's eye to the story of Genesis. When God called forth the light, when he separated the sky from the land, when he produced vegetation of all kinds, when he called forth the, the sea creatures and all the birds of the air, and then he called forth the animals from the land, and on that sixth day, do you remember what he did? At the height of it all, he took most care and concern in creating mankind. We did not come about by chance. We were a special creation, are a special creation of God. And so God took a lump of clay and he breathed into it the breath of life and Adam became a living being. And from him, he took Adam's rib and he formed and fashioned it with care and concern and made Eve and brought them together and blessed them. And what did God say after those six 24-hour days of creation? He said that everything he made was very good. It was perfect. It was good. It was holy. And not only were Adam and Eve in harmony with each other, but better than that, they were in harmony with God himself. They were united to him. We're told in scripture that he would even converse with them. He would come down and talk to them in the garden in the cool of the day. How awesome would that be? But Adam and Eve were given life. That's what, that was God's intent for this world. A special creation testifying to his beauty and his wisdom and his grace and his love. But at some point, Adam and Eve weren't satisfied with that life. They thought, they thought at the temptation of Satan that there could be something more. And so both of them reached out and took the fruit Eve first took from the tree and ate because she thought there was something more than the life God could give. And then she took some and handed it to Adam and he ate because he thought there could be something more than the life that God could give. But in return, what did they find? They got death in place of life. They cut themselves off from God. 
And so from that time on, the ancestors of the human race passed on sin to all of us. And we are not innocent either. That's the message that Paul shares today. Why is the world the way that it is? Why does death exist? Well, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all people, because all sinned. To be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who is a pattern of the one to come. What Paul is saying is this. God gave Adam a specific command, and he told him not to break it, and if he did, death would come. But then until Moses came, there was no explicit law given. Man knew what God commanded in his heart, though it was a little bit darkened. It was like looking at something through dirty glasses. Mankind knew that it was wrong to cheat and steal and kill and show violence and hate to others. But there wasn't an express command. But even though there wasn't an express command, until the time of Moses, what reigned? Death did. Why? Because all sinned. And that's a painful message for us here today, isn't it? Because death hangs like a specter in the air. We see it all around us. We have experienced it this last couple weeks in our lives. Loved ones have passed away. And it's the starkest testimony to what Paul says here. And the reason that death exists in the first place is because of us. Because of us. And we cry out then for deliverance from that. We don't like to see that ugly truth. We need a hero to come and stop death in its tracks. We need someone to give us life in place of death. And that's the good news that we want to consider for today. Because Paul goes on to say, yes, though death was given in place of life when we brought sin into the world, when we sin every day, life is now given in its place through Jesus our Savior. Paul says, But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many, that is to all mankind, and then to whoever will believe in him. Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation. But the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. One righteous act, from Christ's conception to his death, that was one massive righteous act for you and me to save us from our greatest enemies of sin and death and hell. And by Christ coming into the world to be that perfect second Adam, he completely gives us the innocence that we need. He shatters the shackles of death and sin and gives us life in place of death. And so Paul goes on. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase. That is, that we would recognize how much we've sinned and needed a Savior to deliver us. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness. To bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Yes, Jesus has brought into the world a new era. An era of life and grace. So for all of us who feel the pain of death. Who, who feel the weight of sin in our hearts. We know that he has conquered it for us in our place. There's nothing more to be worried about. There's nothing more to fear. The sting has been removed from death forever so that when Christ comes again, the saying that is written will come true. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, grave, is your sting? But even here today, right, as our hearts are heavy and we mourn those that we've lost, death can seem so strong. 
And didn't it feel strong for Mary too? Think about Mary who went to the tomb on that Easter morning. And her eyes were filled with tears. And Jesus appeared to her and started speaking to her. But in her grief, she didn't even recognize that it was him. And she was pleading that if he had taken the body and put it somewhere, that, she would just, that he would just show her until he spoke her name and said, Mary. And at that, death lost its power for Mary. Death was no longer powerful, but instead, life had conquered. Life was reigning. Jesus had pushed back death, and he wanted her to know, Mary, I am alive forever and ever. You don't have to be afraid. And then think about the disciples. The disciples who had to have struggled with survivor's guilt for the things that they did against their Savior when he needed them most, they probably looked back and thought, if only we would have been at his cross when he died and passed away. But now now our Lord, our teacher, is gone. Is he even the Messiah? Was he the one to come and, and deliver us, his people? We just don't know. And in that, when death seemed so strong, Jesus appeared in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. They got to look him in the eyes. They got to put their fingers in the scars. They got to hear his voice, see him eat a meal with them, and know that death did not hold a candle to the life that their Savior had given to them. Jesus very truly lived in our place as the perfect second Adam, and he rose to give us a very real and lasting life. And so not only will we have a a room in heaven waiting for us right now, and when we breathe our last, will we go there and see Jesus and all those that, that have preceded us in death, but we also look ahead then to the last day. The last day when life will finally swallow up death forever. Our Savior will come in the clouds. He'll reunite the saints that have gone before us with those that are still left behind, and he'll make us all new. And then... What will be true for you and me through the life that Jesus has given? We will live with the Lord forever. Just stop and think about that today. That the loved ones that we've lost these last few weeks, we will see again as we stand in the presence of our Lord and worship Him and rejoice in the life that He has. But we'll be with Him forever. And what will be true when we're with Jesus forever? What does He say in the book of Revelation? That He will be our God and we will be His people That he will take us and he will wipe every tear from our eyes. That then there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. Why? For the old order of things has passed away. The old order that was brought into effect by Adam but was now abolished and conquered in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. The new order will begin. And so now, as we wait to join him, even now we have the victory. One last encouragement for us today as we think about our nation, as we celebrate Independence Day yesterday and think about the the tremendous freedoms that we have, especially the freedom of religion. But we also then see how many people are going farther and farther away from Jesus and how the more people go away from Jesus, the more people will either try to dismiss death, push it to the side and not confront it, or they'll be afraid of death because they see only the things that they've done wrong. Even if that's just before they die, they'll be afraid. But the message that you and I have, the message that God wants the world to know, is that we don't have to be afraid of death. Because Jesus has come to give us all life in place of death. So share that. Share that with your family members. Share that with your friends. When you hear somebody talk about death, somebody that is unchurched and they want to know how you can be so calm in the face of it. They want to know how you don't completely break down. Yes, you grieve, but you still can say that I know I'll see my loved one again. Tell them. Share it with them. Because only this gospel message will bring people back to God. Not party platform. Getting the right person in the White House won't bring people back to God. Not establishing a new set of laws, that won't bring people back to God. The only thing that can is that inextinguishable life of our Savior that he extends to all of us through faith and that he brings to us in the gospel. Rejoice. Rejoice, yes, even in the midst of our pain because our loved ones are now with the Lord. But rejoice also because we will see them again 
And we have conquered death through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to him. He gives us the victory. Amen.